when you talk, you also mentioned how Blue Bottle has always prioritized customer value over revenue. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned the wholesale division getting shut down because you lack sufficient control over what's going on with the process. Uh, so given that customer value is often difficult to measure as opposed to financial metrics like revenue, mm -hmm. uh, how do you determine what projects will deter, uh, deliver the uh, long-term benefit? Well, and you know, I, I haven't been a, a big part of Blue Bottle for five years, so you know, those uh, as the the stakes get bigger, you know, it, the, those things become more pressing, and there's people dedicated to making those decisions. I was always upset at the primacy of measurability. That's where I would have arguments. Like, just because something is measurable doesn't necessarily make it more important than something that's not. Um, and then, you know, at a certain point, the people would come in and all they knew was what was measurable. And that, that was the oxygen they breathed. And so that was a real point of discomfort for me, was, was trying, to, trying to preserve this idea that there are these things that cannot be measured, but are important and valuable and have made us what we are. And, and that was, you know, an argument that I don't think I... I Really argued that well, um, and certainly lost. And so, um, so yeah. At a certain point, you just have to measure more stuff, and that's fine. That's how large businesses are. Nothing wrong. Since we're already on this topic of different projects and revenue streams, uh, I'd like to talk more about Blue Bottle at Home, which is the e-commerce channel for mm -hmm. copy subscription service. Uh, so critics may argue that an online business model may detract from an emphasis on encouraging employees and customers to get to know one another, mm. uh, whether it's as simple as remembering uh, a regular customer's name, or remembering their go-to order, where play a large part in cultivating community spaces. Uh, so how do you envision e-commerce business preserving Blue Bottle's emphasis on customer relationships? Uh, right, well, I mean, that's, that's not my job now, um, but yeah, I think having a subscription is, I'm, I'm miles away, 85, miles away from the nearest bottle of coffee, and I like to get an espresso called 17 foot. I um, brought my old espresso machine that is not usually available in stores. So I'm a subscriber, I, you know, I, I rely on that subscription, and it's got a cute little card, and, and it's very reliable. Um, so I, I think the subscription portion is that there's no real argument. You, you know, getting getting people's order of coffee beans at home, I think, is totally worthwhile and accretive, as they say, um, to having a retail shop. Where I, maybe it's just because I'm old, the whole like app ordering thing, that that wasn't, you know, I just don't like it. I, I don't like ordering on an app, and I don't know if it's because of my generation, or my fussy little preferences, or some purity of experience that after. Um, I know that app is very valuable for coffee businesses in general and the bottle in particular, but that is not the cafe I would build. You know, I didn't build cafes that had online order. And you know, no shade of blue bottle to build those because clearly a lot of people want that. But um, when I was building cafes, I don't really care what people want. If I thought, if I told them what I want, people would like, and for a while they did, and for a while they did, and it was super cool. Correct me if I'm wrong, but Blue Bottle at Home started when you were uh, the CEO of Blue Bottle, right? So were you initially hesitant to launch it, or, because based on what you're saying, it seems like you, you prefer the in-person cafe experience, right? Oh yeah, well, Blue Bottle at Home is the, the bean subscription, mm -hmm. and I've been doing bean subscriptions ever since, you know, 2000 and you know, and I would carry the post office was across the street from my little grocery. I would carry things across the street, and I remember one day I had to make two trips. And it's like, yes, two trips. <laughs> and then one day I had to make five trips. <laughs> like, oh, I better rethink this. Um, so yeah, no, no, blue, the the bean subscription I think is is had, I've always liked that. You know, because people, San Francisco is a tourist destination, so the subscriber in Ohio comes, and then they want to come to the shop. And, 
Got it. So I'd like to further expand on some of the core values that you talked about. That makes Blue Bottle stand out from competitors. Mm -hmm. uh, much of your inspiration from Blue Bottle comes from the cafe culture in Japan, which you talked about in your talk as well. Um, how do you define the current American coffee culture, and what was missing in it that prompted you to look elsewhere? Mm. Well, it's the coffee culture in America now is really kaleidoscopic. You know, like, there was a time I was talking to a friend of mine. There was a time you go to New York, and there are four places, three or four places, that know how to make coffee in New York. And it wasn't that long ago. It was 2009, 2010. I mean, maybe that seems like a long time ago, because I'm almost dropping you off to soccer practice. Um, but yeah, it, was, it, it wasn't that long ago that there were very few places to make coffee. And now, you know, there's a lot of places. And, it's very interesting, you know, the style of those places, it's, I don't know, there's still a purity that I'm looking for in a lot of these places. Some, I, I got a great pour over at a place in Echo Park in LA, meticulous, beautiful clarity, amazing coffee, beautifully roasted, I have Spanish roasted. But then I, I look at their menu and they have like six different drinks, and each drink has four different ingredients, and, you know, and, Matcha latte, Dennis Nath, and that's just not who I am. I mean, I, I'm not saying people shouldn't like those, and I'm not demeaning people that, that do like those. But for me, it was like this is this search for this pure, pure expression. That's what I was most interested in. And that's that's why I'm back working shit, you know, because Benjamin and I are, are going to make coffee in this deeply uncompromised, pure way. Um, and that's I've just gotten more interested in that stuff. In a previous interview by CNBC, I, I know you mentioned you weren't a big fan of that, that interview. Oh, I wasn't a big fan of me. I was the, I looked bored. Um, but in the interview, you mentioned how you didn't feel the pressure of competition from coffee giants like Starbucks, oh. and instead you ended up thanking them for yeah. creating a social culture yeah. around coffee. However, with them entering the high-end coffee market through Starbucks Reserve, has your answer changed over the years? No, no, not at all. Um, you know, my kids go to a good school because of Howard Schultz. You, you know, that, that's just the way it is. I think you could turn off the thing. Did you, you, that interview is on YouTube. Did you look at the comments, the YouTube comments? Uh, I was reading the article. Oh, okay. Yeah. Because <laughs> the YouTube comments, like, you've never seen the word Squidward repeated <laughs> oh, so much <laughs> other than a SpongeBob SquarePants episode. <laughs> 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 Uh, really harsh, man. <laughs> yes. Um, thank you for that. How boring was this? Yeah. Well, I deserve it. Yeah. Uh, no. no, actually, I didn't deserve the YouTube comments. Okay. What were you saying? <laughs> I'm just wondering if your answers change over the years oh. because they, they're entering the high. No, market. no. I, I still think Blue Bottle's roasted coffee product is really, is like, I had an awesome espresso at the kiosk on London Street. It was beautifully named, like, beautifully, sort of much simpler coffee, much simpler coffee blend um, than what I was running it and easier to execute. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that that Blue Bottle can outcompete a lot of, of big, big companies in terms of their roasted coffee product and the vitality that they're capturing and the sourcing. Um, so, yeah, the answer has not changed. Thank you, Adam Schultz, but we can still roast very good coffee. I mean, it seems like there's this con constant emphasis on high quality flavors and you know, the product that you're delivering to the customer has to be of high quality. Mm. Um, so, how did you experiment with creating new and innovative coffee offerings, such as the three A's and the New Orleans style coffee? So, I want to get to know a little bit about your experimentation process. Sure, yeah. Those are very old. Like, that was, you know, a farmer's market, three African. Um, three African coffees that I blended together. I saw it once again as this ensemble. I had this this blend called, which I call Giant Steps, a lot of depth. Anything, like if somebody said they like peas, it's like, okay, you, you might like it. And then I had a very historically based Mocha Java blend that I called Double Donovan, kind of named after my first wife, um, and a poison. Um, and, 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 
Um, and, you know, three days, I just wanted, so there was one note, so I said, two note, L. Donovan, and then three distinct notes. There was a, a initially, there was a Gavin copy, and a Washington Gavin copy, and a drug process. And you, if you balanced it right in the roasting and the blending, then you got, like, really three distinct notes. So it was, like, from one note, to three notes, to three notes. It was very simple. It was done a long, long time ago. Um, and then New Orleans, I'd like to look, I still am more interested in looking at copies of half than before inspiration about the future than any sort of contemporary copy um, culture. So uh, remember that was just about Napoleonic economic self-sufficiency, right? Um, that's what you think when you order New Orleans. Um, they, Napoleon, uh, French didn't have a lot of hard currency and they didn't have a lot of coffee growing lands at that time. So um, chicory was promoted as this coffee substitute and so uh, chicory and coffee was blended when chicory root or is a member of the dandelion family and so um, it can be quite hard so when you mix it with ground coffee it, it's quite pungent and so of course the french took that taste for chicory and coffee to the port of new orleans um, when it was french territory and that kind of taste preference has stayed um, obviously you, you know often more often served with Milk or something that they cut out. So I was looking back. I didn't want to make ice lattes at the Berkeley Farmers Market. It was spring when people started ordering ice lattes. I thought that was a compromised drink because when the pot is supposed to see ice, something is lost. Um, so I started making that, and when people would order an ice latte, I'd give them a little taste. Like, hey, why don't you try this instead? I think you'll like this more. And they did. And, and that, that's been a huge, huge drink. A long time. Just a follow up about uh, the three days. Uh, so when I was watching the video, I was a little bit confused because you did mention about like incorporating uh, flavors of plum, berries. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm curious as to how those flavors get incorporated into the coffee. Because you, you mentioned like the Ethiop two Ethiopian mm -hmm. coffee, and then you mix the Ugandan one. So like, where where is like the food flavors coming from? Oh, that's um, you know once again I, you're calling me on my um, on my tasting notes. Um, so I would, was that the video where I was sitting at uh, Benjamin Brewer? Yeah. Okay. So what that means is that was sort of professional language I was using on this video. And I still, and I had lost that fight a long time ago. You know, now the blend descriptions are quite short and factual. Um, and that, that's fine. As, as a coffee grows, you know, you can't keep, or as a company grows, you, you kind of, sometimes the thing that got you to a certain place is not going to get you to the next. And this way of writing about coffee that amused me and amused our customers when any of them knew who I was, um, you know, is is not the thing that's right for the bottle to do contemporary now and in the future. So I was speaking sort of coffee cupper language, Benjamin Brewer, and it was caught on video. And the bottle sort of is a company that uh, believes that it is not futile to use language to to describe sensory experience, and so I was kind of being a good sport in that sense. Thank you for clarifying that. Thank you for calling I, I like that video over and over again. Oh, wow. Now. <laughs> um, so as you mentioned, in 2015, you stepped down as the CEO of Blue Bottle, and in 2017, Nestle purchased a majority stake in the company. Uh, how did you know that it was time to move on, and what perspective have you gained since stepping back? Mm, well, um, yeah, but for, you know, I think I shared a little bit of my perspective. I was, I was tired. At you know, it was a long run, and I was just tired of fighting about stuff, tired of arguing, tired of arguing about white meat. You know, it's like everything mattered. The smallest detail, everything mattered to me, and it just got exhausted. And then um, you know, the Nestle transaction happened, and and I thought that was you know, positive because the financial freedom for my family and, and we probably didn't have to keep going back for more for more funding rounds. And but at the same time I, I wanted to participate and it was very ambiguous sort of what my role was and I was uncomfortable in that ambiguity for a long time. But um, you know and, and now I've kind of gotten more comfortable with that ambiguity. And 
And now there's like this little iteration, this, I don't know if it's a final chapter, but it's a chapter that I, mean, I didn't anticipate that I'm looking forward to. So I'll just see what happens after that. And then I'll go back to tending my citrus tree and reading the chart again. Um, if I, if I care. Um, but I, I feel lucky, I, you know, I'm, I'm happy that sort of I was kept on in this ambiguous way, so now I can try to express this thing that is you know, very important. Can you give us some of your current work? You're now a strategic advisor for Bar Agricole, a restaurant in San Francisco with a commitment to single origin spirits. Mm -hmm. At Blue Bottle, you also maintain a focus on sourcing single origin beans. Uh, so what draws you to food that is sourced from one producer? It's it's the the sensory experience. I, I just had dinner with Dad from Bar Agricole. They have a tasting room in San Francisco that I encourage you to go to. Beautiful, meticulous, meticulous. Um, spirits that he sourced all over the world. He wrote a book called By the Smoke and the Smell. That's a beautiful book about sourcing all over the world. Mezcal, that was in Oaxaca, Scott, in Scotland, um, from tasting rum in, in Cuba. So that is a, like a very deep thinker about things that I like to think about too. Uh, I, I've always found him quite inspiring. So when he asked me to um, help him, on this, I felt like it was something I could help him with. Um, but it's very inspiring. But beautiful ice, beautiful Japanese tumblers, incredible spirit, good food too. Seems as though this emphasis on single sourcing can also be tied back to Blue Bot's emphasis on sustainable cultivation practices, right? Um, so I do want to talk about sustainability a little bit. Uh, for making your first plan with stainless steel stock pots, that's your plan. Investing in efficient roasters that uh, reduce carbon footprint by more than 125,000 pounds each year. Mm -hmm. uh, Blue Bottle has placed a lot of emphasis on sustainability from the beginning. Uh, what, if any, challenges does Blue Bottle uh, face when they implement company wide sustainable practices? Oof. It's a little broad. Right? No, that's all right. Um, man, you've done a deep dive. How have you had time for just a few months? Yeah, the stainless, I just didn't like plastic. You, you are very influenced by the farmer's market. So I didn't like plastic. Uh, Blue Bottle was uh, the first, among the first to use PLA line cups and lids. I didn't. I had PLA line back. You, you know, PLA is not perfect, um, but at least it was supporting an industry. It wasn't plastic. It was, you know, corn. And, uh, it was an extract made from corn, and that's a commodity crop, and it, you know, and all that. Um, but I, I just like the simplicity and the purity and sustainability of the farmer's market was what guided me to my current stance on sustainability and my stance when I was running the bottle. 